Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday Morning Breakfast Bible Study with Pastor Lydia Spragan. We're going to give you a couple of minutes to get yourself together and get ready to dive into God's Word. We are a How to Study the Bible class, and I go through various approaches as to how to study the Bible. We are learning now about the uh, Bible character study. And we are in the book of Acts. And we have chosen as our character Barnabas. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible character study, uh, I will explain. And then I will explain uh, that there are seven steps to a Bible character study. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God. We pause to allow your Holy Spirit to make his entrance into this place. We want to be led into the truth. And so, Father God, who knows the mind of God like the Spirit of God? And we are asking this morning that he come and teach us what he would have for us to know. And then empower us to share all that we have learned with someone else. And to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, a character Bible study is a method for studying the Bible that focuses on one specific person written about in God's word in order to learn from their mistakes and victories, understand their role in God's ultimate plan, and apply lessons in their life to ours. Now, in order to do a character Bible study, there are seven steps. Number one, choose a character. And try to find something that's going to summarize their story. Uh, you can certainly Google their name, and find out a little about them and kind of write down an overview of what it is that you have found. Now remember, you are going to study to show yourself approved, a workman unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. So don't just take everything that you write for grant uh, that it's the truth. You yourself search, search the scriptures and see if you can find the truth for yourself. And it may differ with one of the commentaries. Um, find out what they're known for, their strengths and their weaknesses, their victories and challenges. Now, I also can substitute in where I have victories and challenges, important acts and events that I want to focus on in their life. How they point us to Christ and the lessons that we can learn from them. Now, the character that we have chosen is Barnabas. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Joseph, or Joseph. He's called Barnabas by the disciples, the son of consolation, or the son of encouragement. Now, after we've written the summary of his story, what is he known for? And then we looked at his strengths and weaknesses. And now we are looking at their victories, and challenges, or important acts and events. Now last week, I was in the middle. So I'm just going to go down the list of scriptures that we covered on last, last week. In case you missed one, you can go back and look at it for yourself. Acts 4, 36 through 37. Acts 9, 26 through 28. Acts 11, 19 through 26. Acts 11, 29 through 30. Acts 12, 25. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Acts 14, 11 through 18. Acts 14, 19 through 28. Acts 15, 
1 through 4 and verse 12. That's Acts 15 verses 1 through 4 and then verse 12. Acts 15, 21 through 29 and Acts 15 verse 35. Now where we're going to pick up today is in the book of Acts in the 15th chapter the 36th through the 41st verse. Now, I know that we're only supposed to be studying Acts 1, 1 through Acts 6, 7. But what we find out as we begin to study the word is we may set out to study just a small section of the Bible. But in looking at things, we go broader and deeper than we had originally planned. God's word is that way. That's why every time we look at it, we can gain a new nugget of insight. And today we're going to look at Acts 15, 36 through 41. And I don't anticipate that we're going to get through all of this today that I have uh, for us. Because last night when I was reviewing the Bible study, I done, it dawned on me that I didn't agree with the commentator. And I said, why is this disturbing my spirit so? That I don't agree with the commentator. And so I looked at the three points the commentator made about this scripture, which we're going to read in a few minutes. And I'm going to share with you the commentator's point of view and what made me uh, disagree with the commentator. And then the biblical way that I approached it so that I could come to the truth for myself. For myself. Now, I'm no Bible scholar, but I have to actually come to an understanding of God's word for myself. I can't just take what you say to be the gold standard. God has set a standard for me. And it's for me to work out my own soul salvation. And in order for me to do that, then I have to dig into God's word for myself. And when I dig into God's word for myself, then I can figure out the truths for myself. Now suppose I'm wrong. I depend on the Holy Spirit to lead me into the truth. But if at a later date, after more study on a subject, I discover, ooh, that wasn't quite right. Then I go back and I correct my understanding. And I put it in light of what I have now learned. You see, the Bible is not something that we're going to learn in a day. It's not even something that we're going to learn in a week. We can read all 66 books all day long. But unless we study them, and get them in our spirit. And we haven't done nothing. We could have read a magazine for all that's worth. Listen. God's word is alive. And God's word wishes to dwell within you. Empower you. And, and make you have life. And abundant life. Through his word. And as we learn his word. And work out our own soul salvation. You see, that's why we say grandmama can pray for grandmama and grandmama can pray for you. But grandmama got to get to heaven for herself and you got to get to heaven for yourself. Uh, You're going to die by yourself. And when you die, you're going to be responsible to God for what you did or did not do. Here on the earth. Now, let us get to this word. Turn to Acts, the 15th chapter, and go down to the 36th to the 41st verse. And I want to say to you, don't forget what you've already learned. And put into practice that which you already know. Okay? And apply it. The Bible is consistent. From Genesis to Revelation. 
God is saying in the beginning God, and he began, who is God, we say. And he begins to reveal to us who he is. And then he comes to us in the flesh and dwells with us as the God-man. Dies for us, does not stay dead, but rises and the Holy Spirit comes, powers the church, and the witnesses are scattered all over. And then we get to the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus the Christ. So we want to see him, and he reveals to us who he really is in the book of Revelation. The Bible is consistent. It's consistently talking about who God is. How to have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. So when we look at the word, we can't pitch it out and say, Oh man, this part, I don't know where it fits. You might not know today where it fits. But keep reading. Keep learning. Keep studying. Keep applying it to your life. And eventually, you're going to figure out where it fits. Acts 15, 36 through 41. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of God, or the word of the Lord, and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And, Samar and, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, here's what the commentary says, which I wrote down. For the second missionary journey, Barnabas and Paul had a sharp disagreement over whether they should take John Mark with them. As a result, they parted ways. Barnabas took John Mark and Paul took Silas. Clearly, at least one of them was wrong in this disagreement. I think, the commentator says, I think that Paul was right and Barnabas erred in his dissension. Here are some reasons. And he goes along and he gives three reasons for the way he thinks. Reason number one, Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he supports that by saying 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, and Titus 1.1. 1, 1. And Barnabas should have deferred to him. Here's the second reason. He says when Paul chose Silas, they were, quote, committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord, unquote. No such statement is made of Barnabas and Mark. Here's his third reason. Barnabas is never mentioned again in the book of Acts and is only briefly mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. Paul, of course, is mentioned extensively and wrote much of the New Testament. I read that and the wheels started turning in my head. What? And I looked at that, and I had prayed for the Holy Spirit to guide me in my study. And not only were wheels turning, bells were ringing. And I said, what's up with that? So I looked, and it says, clearly, at least one of them was wrong in their disagreement. I said, how is it so clear? It's not clear to me that one of them was wrong. 
God was in charge and God chose this method and this manner for them to separate, go their separate ways so they can spread more of the gospel maybe. But doesn't necessarily mean clearly one of them was wrong. Every time you have a disagreement, it doesn't mean that somebody is wrong. It simply means on this particular point, you have different perspectives. And that's because you come out of your experience. And my perspective may not be your perspective. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. That doesn't mean you're wrong. That just means at this point in time, our perspectives are not lining up. But the one thing that we do know about Barnabas, that he was always trying to be in line with God. Now, he wasn't perfect. And Paul was sent, called on a mission by God, that perhaps Barnabas was not. So clearly that was not clear to me. He says, I think that Paul was in the right and Barnabas erred. Now he's choosing which one is right and which one is wrong in this dissension. And then he gives us the reasons. So I looked at the first reason. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, biblical references, and Barnabas should have deferred to him. I said, wait now. Didn't we just read in Acts, the 14th chapter, and the 14th verse? Let's turn to it in case we've forgotten it. Acts, the 14th chapter, and the 14th verse, where it says, Which when the apostles, comma, Barnabas and Paul, comma, heard of their of uh, her of uh, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out now I'm reading from the King James Version and one of the things that I told you long time ago was don't forget what you learn in school about English grammar and punctuation so the first thing I see here is in the 14th verse, it says, which when the apostles, plural, comma, Barnabas and Paul, comma. Now they're going to explain, and the comma is going to set it off to draw our attention to it, which apostles they're talking about. And they're talking about Barnabas and Paul. Not Barnabas or Paul, but Barnabas and Paul. So at this point, we know that Barnabas and Paul, even if we haven't read anything but, but, but this particular passage, we know that Barnabas and Paul are apostles. So then we go back and look at what the commentator says. And he says, Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Barnabas should have deferred to him. Paul and Barnabas were both apostles. There was no deference. God is not a respect of person. So there was no deference given to Paul that wasn't given to Barnabas. So I write in the margin here, and you'll see I've got all kinds of notes scribbled here that I'm going to go over. I've done my, I've done my research here, may, uh, may possibly on the internet, maybe in a book or whatever, and I've written it all out so that I have it before me, and I left some wide margins over here so that I could write my own notes and make my own interpretations and study to show my own self approved and I say I write in my little margin here Acts 14 14 and I should probably also write both were apostles so to me biblically that blows statement number one out of the water because I'm going to take what the word says over what you have written here. Number two, when Paul chose Silas, they were, quote, committed by the brethren 
to the grace of the Lord, unquote. No such statement is made of Barnabas and Mark. So, I look at it, and I remember that we've read Acts 13 and 2. So, I go back, and I look at Acts 13 and 2. And, and I'm going to back up to Acts 13 and 1 just so we can put it in context and understand where I'm coming from. Now, let me just simply say, my memory ain't all that great. And I don't remember a lot of things probably that I should. And I have a senior moment every now and then, like most of us. We forget where the car keys are and know where, where we, we just laid them down. We forget our glasses and they're sitting on the top of our heads. So we, we, we don't have the memory to remember everything. That's why when we start our Bible study, we invite the Holy Spirit to come in so that he can lead us into all truth. The other thing that he would do is bring things to our remembrance. Okay, so I'm not all that in a bag of chips. And there are some people who know the word backwards and forwards and upside down. I'm not one of them. So I asked the Holy Spirit to help me. Okay, so he takes me over to Acts 13. And he says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manion, which been brought up with Herod the Tetriarch, and Saul. So I see Saul's name, and I know that that is the original name of Paul. His name hasn't been changed yet to Paul. So I can say, and Paul. But his name is Saul. And I see that Barnabas and Saul were present. Okay? Verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, now the Holy Ghost trumps everybody. I don't care what man says, they were committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. Listen, man can lay hands on you, but if the Holy Spirit does not anoint you for the work, it don't matter. So, the, 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 when Paul chose Silas, they were committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. But listen, it says, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, The Holy Ghost spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, Separate for me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Oh. The Holy Spirit. Has put a calling on their lives. The Holy Spirit didn't say they're going to be together forever. But for right now they are together. But I put a calling on your life. That means your life may go this direction. And my life may go this direction. But the Holy Spirit has a calling on each of our lives. It's not the same calling. Could be the same calling. But it's not necessarily the same calling. Paul had a mission to the Gentiles. Barnabas is the son of consolation and the son of encouragement. And the calling on his life as an apostle was don't forget to give people second chances and to encourage them. That wasn't Paul's calling. That was Barnabas' calling. So when I read here, when Paul chose Silas, they were committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. No such statement is made of Barnabas and Mark. I immediately wrote on my notes, Acts 13 and 2. His calling. 
not forever together, but for a reason and a season. They were on different assignments. And, 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 and they traveled together for a reason that the Holy Spirit knew. For a season that the Holy Spirit gave them. And then he separated them again. So that Paul could go on about his journey and his assignment. And Barnabas could go on about his journey and his assignment. So I look and what I know about Barnabas, I wrote in my notes. Because here's what I knew about Barnabas. I felt Barnabas was more Christ-like in his approach. Not that Paul didn't have Christ, but when I compare the characteristics of Christ in this particular instance, I'm looking at how does Barnabas appear to Christ at this point to me. Because my character study is a Barnabas. My character study is not a, Bar a Paul. Not doing him. So I'm asking the Holy Spirit, what should I see in Barnabas at this point? And the Holy Spirit says, it's Christ-like in his approach. He exercised forgiveness. He exercised forgiveness. He left that he left. John Mark left. Okay, man, I forgive you. Let's move on. I'm not going to hold that mistake against you. I forgive you. He exercised grace to look beyond his mistakes and faults and see his need. John Mark had a calling on his life too. And Barnabas is like, man, I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to console you. You messed up, but that doesn't mean that God can't use you. Come on, man, come with me. I'm going to encourage you along the way. And I'm going to give you some grace. I'm not going to hit you over the head with what you've done in the past. I'm going to give you some grace. I'm not going to be one of them people say, I know what you used to do. I know the places you used to go. And I know that you done walked out on me and left me before. And you may do it again. But I'm going to exercise some grace right here, right now. Because I ain't all that in a bag of chips too, either. I've had my weaknesses. And I've had my strengths. And God picked me up. Cleaned me up. Placed my feet on the solid rock. Turned me around. Straightened me up. And started sending me in the right direction. And what he has done for me, he can do for you. So he's exercising some grace. And then, I, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of the Veggie Tales. And uh, in the Veggie Tale called Jonah, there's a song called God is a God of Second Chances. So I write, I wrote that down. God is a God of Second Chances. Paul wasn't willing to give him a second chance. But Barnabas says, I'm going to give you a second chance to get it right. Because God will give you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, a sixth chance, a seventh chance. And God gives you a chance and an opportunity to come to a clear understanding. Ooh wee! I messed up. That's what confession is all about. You see, confession means that we agree with God. About how God is looking at things. And God is saying. Leaving them wasn't a good thing. And I got a work for you to do. And you need to learn how to stick to it. Through thick and thin. And I'm, I'm going to match Barnabas with you. So that you can get some discipline in your life. And get yourself together. And Barnabas going to walk with you. And mentor you. Now remember. Barnabas was at Antioch 
where they were first called Christians, there was something about Barnabas that people saw and said, hey, he talking about Christ. They started calling them Christians first at Antioch. So Barnabas is exhibiting to John Mark some forgiveness, some grace, and he's showing him by his actions that God is a God of second chances. So I'll write that down in my notes. Then I write down Barnabas exercised humility. He didn't need a title or a name to be mentioned. Barnabas wasn't all about all of that. Now, listen. Here, we have to go back to what we know. Who is writing the book of Acts? It's Luke. And he's a historian. And he's an eyewitness to things that's going on. And the book of Acts is focused on basically two people, Peter and Paul. He mentions Barnabas because he's worthy of being mentioned. But he's not the focus of the story. Luke's focus is on Paul. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes because I'm going to show you that. He was on assignment. And by he, I mean Barnabas. He was on an assignment. Not from man, but by the Holy Spirit. And we learn that John Mark was family. Now sometimes God send you to your family and you be like, wait a minute God. Uh-uh. I'd rather go to them heathens in the street than try to minister to my family. They the hardest ones. They don't want to listen to a thing I got to say. But Barnabas carried himself in such a way. And he told John Mark, I'm going to take you with me. And something about the way he said to his relative, I'm going to take you with me. We're going to hang out together made John Mark decide to go with Barnabas. Again. It's something when your family can look at you and see that you're different. That you're living the life that you preach, pray, and sing about. Living the life as a witness. But perhaps John Mark wasn't there yet. I had a friend, a very close friend, who said to me, the devil I know, he's with me every day. Tell me more about this Jesus that you know. Now, she didn't mean tell me. She meant show me. Show me more about this Jesus that you know. So, maybe John Mark was at that point where, yeah, 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 I, it, this this Jesus, you, man, he talk about him a lot. Every time I, I see Barnabas, he talking about this Jesus. This Jesus means a lot to him. Well, I'd like to know more firsthand about what he's talking about. Barnabas had discernment. How do I know? Because he could see in people what other people couldn't see. Look at Paul. The disciples didn't really believe that Paul had been transformed. This man had been running around the country persecuting people. Right, left, and otherwise. And had gotten the authority to do so. And yet, when he got knocked off his animal on the Damascus road, Jesus asked him, question, why kick you against the prince? And his life changed.
right then and there on the spot. He went in the straight street. I find that ironic that he was on the wrong path. And the path that the address that God had him to go was on straight street. Look at God. All right, I ain't gonna shout because I got I got a whole thing, a whole message about Paul and that that interaction, that personal experience that he had with Jesus the Christ. So he's on straight street. Folk can't forget what he was. Oh no. That man was a persecutor. Oh no. You can't tell me he have turned his life around. I know him. And Barnabas says. Listen. I'm going to come alongside you. And I'm going to console you. And I'm going to encourage you. And, and, and I'm going to forgive you for the things you used to do. The things you used to do and the places you used to go and the people you used to hang out. Because I believe that since you had a personal encounter with Jesus the Christ, not only were you changed, you were transformed. And the man you used to be is not the man that you are today. Oh, that's saying something. That's saying something. Paul should have remembered that, but he didn't couldn't get out of the rut of what John Mark had done. But but Barnabas, he could see his potential as a helper to others. And later on, we know that after John Mark had traveled with Barnabas, that he became instrumental to Peter and Paul. Watch out now. God can use you to bring somebody to the place that God wants them so that they can be about God's business and God's assignment. Do your name need to be mentioned? Barbara said, I don't care. God didn't. Yeah. I'm happy with Jesus alone. I'm happy just doing what, what God wants me to do. I'm happy just 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 serving the Lord. I don't need my name mentioned. I don't care if they they, they you know if I'm an apostle or not. I'm just Barnabas. And I'm the son of encouragement and the son of consolation. I know who I am. And I know what my assignment is. And I don't need validation from man to be carrying on God's business. He was humble. So, when we get down here to point three, where it says Barnabas is never mentioned again in the book of Acts and is only briefly mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament, Paul, of course, is mentioned extensively and wrote much of the New Testament. Well, how about that? And what do I recall at that point? I recall who Luke is. Luke is writing the story. It's as much of an a autobiography as it is a biography. It's a history of the church. And Luke had an important role to play. He was on the same. His role was to write down that which he had seen and heard and deliver it to Theophilus, whose name means lover of God. What he had seen and heard and observed for himself. Don't we, don't we don't need to forget. Let's turn back to Acts the first chapter. Acts the first chapter. And he says in the first verse. The former treatise have I made. O Theophilus. Of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up. After that. He, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, 
being seen of them 40 days and speaking of many things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled. And then he goes on to talk about. And he's focused on Jerusalem at that point. But Paul is on a journey. Luke is on a journey. And part of his assignment. Is to write down. All the things. That have been done. So that other folk. Will be able to read it. The lovers of God. And see it for themselves. Now, how he going to do that? He's not focused on Barnabas. He's focused on Peter and Paul. And now he's focused on Paul. Why? Because Barnabas and Paul traveled together. But Luke and Paul traveled together. Luke and Paul traveled together. You say, how do I know that? That Luke was traveling with Paul at some point. Well, after they stopped mentioning Barnabas, Luke pops into the picture. And we know that by what is known as the we passages of Acts. The we passages of Acts. Now, let's look at those we passages. Let's turn to Acts. The 16th chapter, the 10th through the 17th verse, in Acts, the 16th chapter. Now, first of all, he tells us that he's never again mentioned in the book of Acts. So, after Acts 15, 36 through 41, we don't never hear Barnabas again in the book of Acts. But in the very next chapter, we start to see something that we haven't seen before in the book of Acts. We start to see we and us. Now, we means me and you together. We, us. First person, plural. Don't forget your English. Okay? Us. Not them, but us. Me and you. We, me and Paul. Me, Paul, Lucas said, we, Paul and I, we have done some things. And us. So let's just take the first passage. Acts the 16th chapter. Remember, that's the last time we mentioned Barnabas. So the commentators write in that respect. Barnabas is never mentioned again in the book of Acts. That's true. But he says, and is only briefly mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. He was only briefly mentioned in the book of Acts. Paul, uh, Luke wrote about him. And how he was a companion to Saul and Paul. And then they split up. Luke was done with, with, with uh, Barnabas. And it, and it says, Paul, of course, of course, the commentator says, is mentioned extensively and wrote much of the New Testament. That's a fact. But the writer of Luke and Acts is on assignment. And in chapter 16, starting at verse 10, and this is where you'll need your colored pencil or your highlighter or red pen. And if you don't have one of them, don't worry about it. Use your regular old pen. And circle everywhere you see we and us. And for the first time in the book of Acts, Luke starts to write the word we. Because remember, Luke is a historian. He's already been to Mary and interviewed her. Else he wouldn't have known what the angel said to her. Luke is a historian, and his job is to write the facts. So now Luke says, Barnabas is gone, but I was present. And now I'm about to write to you what I saw for myself, what I heard for myself. Nobody told me this. I didn't go interview anybody for this. I saw these things for myself. So he starts to write, 
in chapter 16 down here verse 10 and after he had seen the vision well who saw the vision so let's walk back up so we can see let's go back to verse 6 now when they had gone through Papyra and this region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After that, still talking about they, so let's go back to verse 3. Him will Paul have to go forth with him. So we're talking about Paul and somebody. And they will come to Mashi, Mish, Misha. And they assayed him to go into Bithynia. But the spirit suffered them not. And they passing by Maisha came to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. That there stood a man of Macedonia. And prayed him saying come over into Macedonia and help us. And after I'm in verse 10 now. And after he had seen the vision immediately. We, me and him, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us, me and him, for to preach the gospel unto them. Now, let's keep reading. And what I want you to do is circle we and us every time you see it. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayers were wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, this is who, my, who I am named after, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto them, unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there, and she constrained us. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her Masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us. And cried saying, These men are servants of the most high God. Which show unto us the way of salvation. Verse 17. I'm going to stop right there. Now, the whole writing of the book has now shifted. Luke has now turned his attention to we and us. He's not talking about Barnabas and Paul anymore. He doesn't even want to talk about John Market unless, unless he has to. His concern in his writings now is we and us. Okay? 
Let's turn to Acts, the 20th chapter, and begin at the 5th verse. Remember now, the commentator then told us that Paul, of course, is mentioned extensively and wrote much of the New Testament. Barnabas is gone, by the way. But the but that's not the point. The point is that the writer has now changed his focus and his writing. And his focus was on two people, Peter and Paul. And his focus got tuned into Paul as his name was Saul and he was out there persecuting the Christians and now he wants to tell us how God can make a difference in your life if you have a personal encounter with Jesus the Christ as Saul did not only will your life be transformed, but your name will be transformed. You might be known in the streets as, you know, Bucci Jr. But when you are transformed, your reputation as Bucci Jr. is changed. Your name in the streets is changed. Your character is changed. You know Bucci Jr.? Yeah, you mean that, that person who is now living for Christ. All he used to do. He used to be. Can you imagine the testimony of used to be? And used to do? And Luke has now changed his focus to say, I've talked a little bit about Paul. I told you his name was Saul and how he persecuted the Christians and how he was there when 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 Stephen was was stoned and how they didn't believe that he had really been, you know, changed, transformed. And I did. And I wanted to encourage him and console him, strengthen him. So I went and looked for him and I brought him to empty ark where he would be a part of a place that we are known as Christians. And when he leave there, and he's traveled with me for a while, the Holy Spirit will let me know when it's time to go. And I don't know how the Holy Spirit going to do it, but the Holy Spirit himself is going to let me know that it's time to go. And so the Holy Spirit separated Paul and Barnabas. Paul took Silas and was commended by man. Barnabas took John Mark because he was called by the Holy Spirit to do so. That was his mission. That was his assignment. That was his reputation. They didn't call him Joseph. They called him Barnabas. And so Luke is now saying enough of that. I want to continue this story about this man named Paul. Who I introduced to you when he was out there. Way out there. And now I'm going to bring him to you in a different light. And I know, I know that he's truly transformed because I walked with the man. I talked with the man. I traveled with the man. I heard the man speak. I ate with the man. I slept with the man. I know the man. And I know the things he used to do, he don't do no more. And the places he used to go, he don't go no more. And I'm going to tell you that because I was with him. I was with him. So let's go to Acts, the 20th chapter, and begin at the 5th verse. Again, we're looking for, for words like we and us. These 
going before. Tarry for us at choice. Us. Who us? Paul and Luke us. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in lie in five days, where we abode seven days. We we and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morn, on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chambers where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had brought bread and eaten and, talking, and talked a long time, a long while, even to the break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. And we went before to ship and sail unto Asos, there intended to take in Paul. But so he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to whatever you want to call that, middling. And we sailed then. Because I'm not concerned, I'm never concerned about pronunciation. And I know I don't always get it right. And there's some people in my life who will call me up after this discussion and they say, you know, you really butchered that word. It's pronounced like this. And I'll say, okay, next time I'll know exactly how to do it. But I don't want to hinder you from reading the word. Just be consistent about what you call it when you see it. Then you can go back like I do sometimes. I know I've had trouble with this word. And I'll go back and type this word into the Google. And I'll say pronunciation. And it'll tell me what the correct pronunciation is. And sometimes I have to laugh because I was so far off. But I didn't let me not knowing how to pronounce the word keep me from reading and getting the point I was trying to make. Now, if you keep reading from Acts 25, verse 5, to 21, verse 8, you will find we and us, we and us, we and us, we and us a lot. And I'm going to give you the other we passages. And I want you for homework to read those. And then you can decide for yourself. Not what the commentator says. Whether or not you agree with the commentator. And if you don't, you can come to your own conclusion. About what that word means. And how it works. And how you come to it. And the biblical references for it. You might agree with me. And you might not. That don't mean that one of us are wrong or one of us is right. What that means is we come at it from a different perspective. And that's what studying the Bible is all about. To get your eyes focused on God. And what God is saying to you at that time and at that season and in your understanding. And you are responsible for that which you know and understand. James says to know to do good and to do it not. To him it is a sin. You may not know yet. That's all right. When you do know better, you're going to do better. And you're going to confess. You're going to agree with God that you were wrong in your understanding. And not only are you going to confess, you're going to repent. God forgive me. I was wrong 
and I'm going to turn from that thought in that way, and I'm going to repent, and I'm going to do better. I'm going to confess, I'm going to repent, and I'm going to continue to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, here are the other we passages that you want to write down. We, us passages, I call them. Acts 21, verse 19, to Acts 26, verse 32. Picks up again, Acts 27, verse 1 to 28, to chapter 28, verse 16. Now, those are the we, us passages. How do we know that this is the Luke that traveled with Paul? Okay? Let's look at two places that we can tell. Let's turn to Philemon. We studied Philemon early on in our studies. We know that it's near the book of Hebrews. So let's see if we can find it. And if you have trouble finding it, don't ain't no shame in your game. Turn to uh, the table of contents. Find the book of Philemon, P H I L E M O N. It's only a page long, so you might miss it. And uh, you don't have to say chapter one. You just simply say verse, cause it's only one quote unquote page, and it's not broken into chapters. So you simply say verse. So let's go down here to verse 23. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristus, Aristarchus, Themis, and Lucas my fellow laborers. Here in Philemon, Luke is referred to as Lucas. Lucas, my fellow laborers. He's called a fellow laborer. And in Colossians, Colossians, chapter 4 verse 14 chapter 4 verse 14 it says Luke the beloved physician and Demas greet you so they're with him and they greet you and in 2 Timothy, that's in the T section of the Bible. 2 Timothy, the 4th chapter and the 11th verse. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Oh, is this same John Mark that he didn't want? Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me. For the ministry. He didn't want him at first. But after he spent some time with Barnabas. Now he says. Take Mark. And bring him. With thee. For he is profitable to me. For the ministry. And he also says. Only Luke is with me now. So bring Mark. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this study. We thank you, Father God, that we have learned today not to rely on what we read, but to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman who is rightly dividing the word of truth so that we can work out our own soul salvation, know what it is that we believe and why, and can prove it by the Bible. Not so that we can argue with somebody about what it said or who is right or wrong, but so that we will know for ourselves what our truth is 
and our experience is so that we can grow in our relationship with you and mature as Christian disciples. We thank you, Father God, for the Holy Spirit today. We love you. Help us where we're weak. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Remember, God really does love you, and so do I. Until next week, keep reading, keep studying, keep building your relationship with God. Thank you, and amen, and praise God.